Hi, this is Steven Seiler. I'm sitting in my office in Norway. It is uh, feeling a bit like spring, even though it's still officially winter time. And I know a lot of people are training and building up their base and perhaps getting ready for big events like the London Marathon. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about marathon pacing. And once you start talking about marathons, you also almost have to take up the issue of hitting the wall. So we're going to also see what that looks like uh, a bit more physiologically. Three questions. What pace should I aim for if I'm going to run a marathon? You probably run shorter distances, but the marathon doesn't happen so often. And then what does hitting the wall actually mean? And is it inevitable? Does everybody hit the wall in the marathon? So let's begin by looking at high performance runners, some of the best in the world, and look at the relative pacing strategies or pacing relationships between short races and long races. This is a very typical way to try to get a, a bead on uh, what pace you should go for in a marathon. So to get into this data, I we used a customized piece of software that a guy named John Peters developed and we interrogated the International Athletics Federation database, found all the top 500 performances for 5,000, uh, 10,000, half marathon and marathon in recent seasons, identified all of those and then cross-referenced them to find the uh, situations where a single athlete had performed all four of those distances in the same season and they were all top 500 performances. Once we did that then we cooked it down to 37 male athlete seasons that were identified and 75 female athlete seasons. In other words it's not too often that these athletes do all four of those distances in one season but we found some. Now a few of the races just weren't good enough. They were bad days, meaning the short distance was slower than fa uh, longer distances, so we kicked those out. But that left us with 440 performances. And these data sets were then analyzed to look at the relationships among the distances from a pacing point of view. We ended up with uh, females from 24 different countries and males from 10 different countries in the data set and you can see that the level is very high so these are you know highly trained performers not necessarily the absolute best in the world but they're close and this is the traditional regression equation type of lines you see males and females are identical in terms of the relative velocities at the different distances the only difference is the uh, the absolute pace or speed and uh, the relationships are very tight and consistent if you don't have the speed in a 5k you're not gonna there's no magic that's gonna happen in the marathon uh, so these relationships go are, are quite consistent across distances here is the the kind of the money table this is the actual velocity ratio for different combinations for example the 5K on average is run about 4% faster than a 10K. The pace is 4% higher. The entire spectrum from 5K velocity to marathon velocity only covers, it's a 13% change in velocity. That's not huge. And it's identical for males and females. So you can see that across the line. There's no difference in the in the females performances relatively speaking uh, from the males so that's important to point out now so as an example if your current 5k is 20 minutes that's a four minute per kilometer or 629 minute per mile then if you're trying to make an estimate of what your marathon pace will be optimally then based on these data these highly trained athletes you would use 113 percent or a, a correction factor and says if I can if it takes me 240 seconds per kilometer in a 5k 
then it'll be 113 percent of that or 271 seconds per kilometer in a marathon so that means that instead of a four minute you'd probably be running about a 431 uh, so it's not a huge spread and and in, and of course in age groupers that spread can actually even be less so what about hitting the wall what does this mean it's in the marathon it's this very <laughs> uncomfortable deal where you start the pay you start the race with thousands of people the pace is manageable it's comfortable you're on a high in the first half and then it starts to feel perceptually grueling you're holding speed but then you reach a point where despite your best efforts you cannot continue at the pace you slow down so the internal load is going up but the external load that you're able to achieve is actually declining that is hitting the wall in a nutshell and we blame this on glycogen depletion in the active muscles but also particularly in the in running and, and on asphalt like in almost all marathons on these hard surfaces there's micro damage to the muscles that starts to add up now is hitting the wall in the marathon inevitable even if you train really well is this just something that's going to happen and if so what does it look like from a you know a sports science geek point of view to get at that I asked uh, some Twitter followers who had run recent marathons flat courses like Valencia or Berlin to send me their uh, files where they have both heart rate and GPS data and they did I eventually managed to accumulate enough that I felt like I could put this all together and so here you see a series of uh, race files this is maximum heart rate so they gave me their, their maximum heart rate uh, data as well and I'm expressing the marathon as percentage of the total time so even if you ran a 212 or a 230 or a 258 everything is scaled as a percentage of total race time uh, I think the slowest marathon here is four hours but most of them were between 212 and three hours now this is kind of what it looks like on average the heart rate stays pretty stable for the first half of the race maybe 60 percent and then on average starts to slide upward so you have a stable phase and then a, a drift phase and and these are marathons that are cool conditions and assuming the athlete is drinking and so forth and then if you look at the pace I've expressed their pace as a percentage of their lactate threshold pace that they provided me with again dividing the marathon race that they submitted in in percentage of total time and the pace is quite consistent they generally you know a, a well-run marathon is going to be at an even pace but if you carefully look at the data it's even up until about the end and then on average it slides a little bit down in terms of pace if we look at the individual information we're going to see uh, there is variation but when you get to about the 80 85 percent point in the marathon you on average see a bit of this wall where internal workloads going up but pace is actually slipping a little bit if you look at it individually here's heart rate and and individuals are individuals and typically I would say around 85 percent of heart rate max is what you're going to be at in the first phase of the race but there are individuals that are holding 90 percent of maximum heart rate and then going up from there uh, over the course of the race and and doing well uh, very few almost none go down so the general tendency for heart rate is is it, it will drift up particularly on the back half of the race so this is this is not an, a pacing error it is just an inevitable consequence of uh, fatigue ensuing however here's what the pace looks like and hopefully the pace stays green meaning stays constant it's about 93 percent on average of the reported lactate threshold pace stays quite even 
but on average tends to slip a little bit at the end. Uh, again though there's individuals who are able to hold pace all the way and there's even a few couple or three that have a, a negative split where they're they're actually running a bit faster in the back half of the race than they did in the second half but when you put these together you end up with kind of three phases of a marathon uh, only two of them are obligatory and then the third one may or may not happen depending on your training and your individual characteristics but phase one first 50 60 percent of race time stable pace stable heart rate if you peg the right intensity it'll be a bit below your first lactate turn point uh, hopefully you're going to stay there as long as possible but from about halfway maybe 60 percent of the way in heart rate will start to drift up even if you're drinking even if you're cool uh, you know it's a cool day uh, but hopefully, despite that, internal workload uh, drift, pace is going to be maintained. So you're starting to see some so-called decoupling, but it's manageable. Phase three may happen, and that is a situation where heart rate continues to climb, but uh, the fatigue hits you enough that pace actually fades a bit. Uh, that doesn't have to be a tragedy if you've gotten most of the way through and you can still end up with a, having a really good race uh, but it just means that you're right on the edge of what is possible for you that day so learning to pace the race is important here's an example from a guy named Ewan Cameron that sent me five different races actually sent me uh, six but one of them was a bit hot so I didn't include that the first marathon he ran was in 324 now, he used to be a quite good teenage runner but he got way out of shape and started running again his first marathon he's he's cruising along quite well and then he he definitely hits the wall his pace this is minutes per kilometer so going up means you're going slower then his second marathon he's faster and he's evenly paced he probably learned from that first one and he actually had a little extra in the tank and so he speeds up in the back side of this marathon and then by the time he gets, this is 216, by the time we're in 218 and 19, he's now down to 228, then a 225, and then a 222. But you see these races are run real, with really even splits. And that is what gets you the best performance, no doubt about, no doubt about it. Here's the heart rate responses. Here's those same three marathons from this fellow named Ewan Cameron six minute difference in the, the PB but the heart rate responses are virtually identical Bobby Murphy sent me a couple uh, files 225 in Valencia 218 222 and 219 here are the heart rates and again they just almost superimposable but three minutes faster uh, so higher speed at the same effort and same physiological intensity. It's like Greg LeMond said, uh, it doesn't get easier, you just go faster. And with that, I'll say thank you before I make any more mistakes on the slides. These are all the people that uh, sent me race files and these are their age and their time so that you know who they were. Thanks a lot for your help. And then I also have to say thanks to my partner in crime, John Peters, he's a data analyst in the UK and a veteran runner and we've kind of you know, we I say him doing all the hard work and me just saying oh, I wish it wish it could do that we've developed some different applications so great guy and he makes these analyses possible thanks for now